yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim. I, uh, I'm the director of UX for our big data suite um, based in the Palo Alto office. I've been with Pivotal since 2012. I uh, started here with labs and moved down to the data team uh, last at the beginning of this year. And um, you know, it's was, it was funny. I'm the first. I'm the first designer um, in the data product. So the Greenplum database and Gemfire and Hawk. Um, those product line. That product line is over 10 years old. And until this fall, there had never, to any large extent, been design um, in the terms of user experience design in the data products. And some of you might ask, well, so what, right? It's like, it's command line, it's, it's terminal work. And um, to a large part, that's true, yes. However, there is, there are other parts of the user experience than the command line itself, right? So your typical database does have some GUIs. They're usually around the management of the, the resources of the system, um, this is PG Admin. It's a, it's a common interface for looking at your database schema and being able to kind of run some queries off of it to understand uh, how it's working. You can manipulate data with it as well. Uh, it's pretty clanky and j janky, but it's, you know, it gets the job done for a lot of people who need uh, that kind of GUI to their system. So we do have some GUIs in our own products. Right, so actually the one that, that I, sh I showed you here is from uh, Greenplum. This is the legacy UI for managing the infrastructure of the system. We're in the process now of developing a new one that's based on the same PIV UI uh, framework that we use in Cloud Foundry. And there are also some open source GUI tools that we work with as well. This is Ambari. It's a common framework for, uh, in, in the Hadoop world, for working with databases and the like in, in that ecosystem. But really what the role of user experience is in a highly technical product like a database, it's not about the GUI, it's not about the interfaces. It's really looking across the experience that we provide for our users and helping that we build what they need. And so that, is, that falls into a whole host of categories, right? It's everything from the documentation and like the getting started guides and the tutorials for how to get up to speed in, in learning and using the tools. Um, it's in the way you interact, the language that you use to interact with the data and with the system, right? The query languages, the messages that the system returns to the user that they are then essentially in conversation with, right? Um, there's actually user experience, of course, in the command line tools, right? The way that the tools are, the way that, that commands are structured, the way commands relate to each other. A lot of it falls into more of the like information architecture um, kind of school of interaction design. There are the GUIs uh, that revolve around the maintenance and metrics of the systems. So what I do, and uh, we've had a couple of labs designers who also have come through the data group now. Uh, we have one who's been on for a while out of LA, Jane Lee, and she, has, uh, she and I have been working with a couple of teams really helping get them established with user research and setting the personas and scenarios, really helping the teams to develop this user-centered mindset such that when they're writing stories and prioritizing the work to be done, they have that additional layer of information and that additional lens and filter as to what value is this providing for the end user in, rel in relation to you know, the work it takes to get done and the, the things that the client, that you know, big gorilla client X is asking for, right? all those things. Um, and we're here to make sure that the users have a voice in that discussion, right? which in a more traditional enterprise environment, uh, you're 
customers, right, the people who are signing the checks, the big like CTO level people, they have a voice, but the people who are using the thing day to day uh, traditionally have less of so. So that's a lot of what, you know, why there's a designer in our database. Right? It's, it's not as much about the GUI as it is everything else that goes along with bringing that mindset. Um, but I will give you a couple examples of what, where some work we are doing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who is going to talk more concretely, probably, about things they have already accomplished in uh, the PCF environment. So one example here is Madlib. So Madlib is a library of machine learning algorithms that uh, you plug in to, I'm going to use like non-technical terms here because I'm, I'm already above my depth a little bit, out of my depth. Um, you plug it into Hawk, which is our SQL on Hadoop database that allows data scientists and business intelligence people and whatnot to run these st statistical models on their data and come up with um, you know, better results for, for the models they're running. Okay, there you go. I just said some things that I don't understand what I said. Uh, but the point is, today you got to, you know, what we're saying is you better know SQL. And if you want to actually understand this, you're going to have to go to the docs and look up this rule thing and whatever this table is and go find out what 0.5 means and what it refers to, right? And, and that's, that's fine, right? So you, there's, a, there's a subset of technical people who are comfortable in that environment. Um, but our goal is to abstract that interface such that it becomes a conversation, right? So we can take that same, that same question that the, the user, in this case a business analyst or data scientist, is trying to answer and ask that question and have a conversation um, and to help to get that accomplished, right? So it's designing a mode of interacting with the system which is less raw than SQL and Python. Uh, the other example is the GUI work that we're doing right now with Greenplum Command Center. So this is the current legacy implementation of all the metrics that are running across you know, dozens of machines on several racks uh, in someone's data center. And essentially what we're saying here is, here's a bunch of graphs. If you need to figure something out, good luck. Here, you know, here's a bunch of graphs. Here's some data for you. And our goal in bringing a better user experience and more user-centered approach to this is to develop a UI that says, let me help you identify the problem. So what we're doing is we go out and we talk with the database analysts, uh, database administrators who are responsible for, this, to, for the maintenance of these systems, understand what problems they see and how they, they attempt to correct them, and then we can develop a workflow, an experience that says, okay, so I understand that the CPU and memory loads are the two biggest indicators of the health of your system. And when you see a particular spike, that, that signals that something is askew, and, and skew is bad in your world. So let's make sure that we can present the, those two things in concert with each other on the same time axis. Oh, and all of this is only relative to the query volume that you're seeing on your system. So let's make sure that's a persistent element of our display. And then we can triangulate that by, for the period of time you see, let's display the particular queries that are running at that time in the system, and that'll help, get, help you to understand the load that's happening such that you can take action and, you know, uh, kill the query or, or restart the system that's, that's gotten janked or whatever it is, right? Janks is a technical term in this world. So that's really all I've got for you. You know, um, we've got, there's, there's all the research and all of the kind of just user-centered approach that we bring by bringing that voice to the table in product management discussions and in story writing and prioritization. The working through, the working through these technical interfaces, right? And 
just abstracting them a bit and helping to make them more of a conversation with the system. And then from the GUI side, everything that, that you know and love about you know, the, the user interface design that, that you see on most of the projects we have here in labs is helping to transform them from here's a bunch of info for you to do something with to I understand your problem, let me help assemble a, a way to get you to a solution. So thank you very much. I'll hold questions until Mike goes as well, and then we can talk to you about our worlds after. Okay, so the, the title of this talk is actually, um, the title for my part of this talk is Designing for a Technical Audience. And I gave this talk at a meetup recently and um, got pretty good feedback on it. So I'm gonna try it again. And then I'm gonna throw in some um, elements of what we do at Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Wow, so there's this really weird phenomenon where um, it'll reshuffle your slides based on random criteria. <laughs> cool, well, this is fun. All right, the good thing we're all family, right? Um, so um, I'm gonna speak, the first part of my talk is about um, different ways of thinking about designing for technical people who do highly technical things and have really deep knowledge about very complex things and how we try to make tools that make those complex things simple so they can do their work and um, evolve their learning together and make better products for us. So the four um, areas I think about those are in uh, usability, fast feedback, testing and verification, and uh, collaboration. So um, in the fast feedback category, we've got things like Travis CI, where you write some code and you push, and Travis CI says whether that push was successful or not, that deployment. Um, the faster a uh, deployment can go through tests, the, um, the faster the developer gets feedback about it. So it's really important that deployments and pipelines run really fast. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here about that, but it's one of those things that we can't really um, get fast enough with always faster. Another one that I really enjoy is when, when we're doing like UI design on the desktop and we can write code and as we're writing code, our UIs literally change based on the CSS or the HTML that we're writing. Um, this is a GIF animation of somebody writing in Sublime some like CSS code and they have like an iOS simulator and a couple browsers open and those, those are connected to like a, a service called Middleman or something like that. And they can literally just play like realize that red background probably isn't the right choice, but at least they got that feedback really fast. Um, another one is in testing and verification. So um, I don't know regex at all, but I can write regex when I use this tool. I needed something that would um, verify a form field and say like whether it was a valid email address or not. So I went to this uh, regexer.com and uh, pasted in some code I copied from Stack Overflow and started customizing it copying and pasting, crowdsourcing my code. Um, but without this tool, I, I really wouldn't have known if the regex was good or not, or if it behaved the way I thought it should. Um, so whoever made this, thank you. Um, and then a really interesting one is around um, physical devices like Arduino boards and the cloud. So some really smart person, I forgot their name, there's a blog article about it, um, they realized that they were wasting a lot of time and a lot of money connecting external drives to Arduinos to store the code kind of offline. So the Arduino board would have to pull the code off of like a drive and they had a really hard time versioning it. And they realized, oh, um, actually Arduino boards all have a unique identifier and I could actually have the Arduino board create its own GitHub account. And Arduino board has its own versioned you know, code that it runs on. So if you run into an error, you can just go back a previous version and it's all in the cloud. You don't have to have like thumb drives laying around. Um, when I saw this, I thought it was fabulously innovative and probably really fast if you're developing Arduino code. Um, another one is collaboration. So um, 
in, in uh, software development, collaboration is key, right? And uh, we care about pairing here. And uh, one of the drawbacks of pairing, if there, if there are any drawbacks, is when you're remote, it's um, a little bit challenging to kind of feel like that you're actually collaborating with someone and, and you're, you can have a conversation with them and you can um, give fast feedback to each other. So these uh, people at Flubits made like a Google Hangout plugin or something. I don't know if anyone here has used it, but it looks really cool. And they look like they're having a really good time. <laughs> and um, so um, collaboration in, in a regard. It doesn't have to be real time. It could be asynchronous, like with um, GitHub. At least you have a feel for who you're collaborating on the code with, just because on the page there's like avatars and all the interactions that they do are you know, recorded and uh, they can create issues. And, and it just brings people closer together around the thing that they're making. And um, again, it's one of those really, it sounds really obvious, but it's actually really hard to do well. How do we make people feel close together when they're making something and they're not physically close? That's an incredibly big challenge. So I think Hub is a really good example of that. And I think um, on Cloud Foundry, we're looking for ways to improve collaboration and improve transparency about who's working on what, and just creating the, those, uh, making those visible so we create opportunities for closer collaboration. Um, so that's a summary of that first part of the talk. These are the quadrants um, that we think about when we think about valuable tools. Um, usability got cut off, but usability, right? Everybody here knows usability. Um, just kidding. So we'll skip that part. We'll go directly into what Pivotal Cloud Foundry does. So basically, everybody downstairs, I'm, I'm probably overgeneralizing, but this is all basically what we're enabling, basically. I mean, there's a lot of other things that we do, but this is the, the magic moment. This is the aha moment that people have when they use Cloud Foundry is they can push an app with one command and it just works. And um, Onsi has this haiku that he wrote. Here is my source code. Run it on the cloud for me. I do not care how. So CF push takes care of a lot of things that people used to have to care about. They used to have to care about servers and machines and configuration of machines. And now they just focus on their apps. And that's because of all the work that we do on the fourth floor and around the world. There's a lot of offices involved. So um, on Cloud Foundry, there's about, at any time, there's like eight to 12 designers. Um, majority, I believe, are in San Francisco. We have some people in Toronto helping. We have, um, uh, we have some people in Denver. We have um, some people in New York. If you all know Spencer Hurst and Ashley, they're in New York. Um, there's actually approximately like 45 teams so we're a little bit outnumbered, but that's okay because not every, not every initiative has like a clear direct experience component, but um, there's a growing number of these that do. And um, another challenge we try to overcome on PCF is how to just get people started. So um, a lot of that CF push magic is invisible and how to get to that point is invisible and um, how to go beyond that point and like make your apps um, you know, more scalable and more performant and more interesting. A lot of that capability isn't visible, so we focus a lot on this getting started aspect. And it's a combination of just really good documentation combined with um, great design thinking. And this is a new uh, version that we have out. It's, it's kind of the baseline. This is how to use Cloud Foundry. You can go to Pivotal.io, click uh, platform, or click get started in the drop down. This is Apps Manager. This is um, one of our kind of flagship UIs that people um, typically see for the first time when they get Pivotal Cloud Foundry or when they go to PDUB's uh, Pivotal Web Services and sign up. Um, and this is where people go to manage them, you know, different environments, apps with different stages of you know, maturity. Some are production apps, some are just development apps. And um, this UI provides a really clear way to address those concerns. This is our metrics UI, and again, we're making something that's typically invisible, visible. This is how your apps are performing on the platform. 
Um, a lot of decisions can be made from a UI like this, like whether to scale an app, whether an app is crashing, whether an app um, um, you know, maybe needs um, a, a different kind of service bound to it to make it more stable. And uh, uh, Kevin Gates and uh, Justin Rusboom are both working on this, as well as um, some other designers in Denver are helping us with research in this space because um, there are some personas that we have as an audience that deal with like hundreds or thousands of apps on the platform and we need to give them tools too. This is our um, Concourse CI. So uh, Kim Ebers on the fourth floor is the designer with Concourse. And um, this is their landing page, their marketing page that they're gonna launch soon. Concourse is a um, kind of a simpler way to manage your pipelines. There's less hidden magic and um, the team that uh, puts it together is really passionate about all teams using CI so that we have more reliable releases and we can release anytime. Um, this is our app distribution UI. This is um, primarily built, out of the, the, uh, built by the team in Toronto. And um, this is so that you can distribute apps uh, for um, mobile devices more easily without having to like, go to the app store and stuff like that. Um, a big part of our effort too isn't, isn't just UI design or you know, incrementally improving experiences. We go back and we do deep research. So this is a, a service blueprint for how, um, how people use um, app distribution and other mobile services that we create. And um, you know, the team does this collaboratively with the product teams much in the same way that a labs uh, designer or PM would do it. We, we facilitate these meetings around you know, who is our audience, what problem are we solving, what's our journey. Um, just always going back to low fidelity before we go into to high fidelity. And this is just another taste of like the, the, the volume of uh, product that we deal with on PCF. These are services that we create for the platform. Some of them have dashboards and UIs, some don't, but all of them have an experience around them, whether you're installing it or you know, deploying it or scaling it. All of them come with an experience. And um, this is another example of one of those experiences for a single sign-on service. And I go back to the beginning to ask you if you have any questions. So I think now Tim and I are just gonna field questions for y'all. So you both mentioned that there are places for UX and design involvement that aren't what we kind of traditionally think of as maybe the center of authority for the designer role of these visually designed pieces of UIs and whatnot. I'm wondering if either of you have had an opportunity to bring user research and this like make sure the customer has a voice perspective to things like APIs and uh, the design of a query language, that, like pieces where they are the fundamental technical experience of the thing. They're not sort of the surrounding accessing enabling layer. They're the thing itself. Like we talk about how design is how it works. I didn't hear design involvement in that in any of what you were talking about, and it's something I'd like to see more of. So I'm wondering how that lands on you. I think I probably didn't show much of that because it doesn't really go on a slide very well. It would just be like, like how do you talk around that? But um, I think Tim kind of hit it with like the, the redesign of that query language. Um, but we, um, and as, as far as Pivotal Cloud Foundry, the product designers pair with product managers a lot on um, what problem are we solving? How do we make this better? Who, what customers can we talk to? Um, once we talk to them, like what are we trying to learn from them? Um, any, everywhere from like recruiting the right people to talk to about a specific problem to what we talk about once we have them um, on the phone or in person. Um, and then um, you know, designing solutions around that. Um, I know that um, Ashley is getting really, Ashley Dunsmore in New York is getting involved in um, ops manager install and upgrade journeys. And that is um, really a lot about like API. And um, it's kind of funny that a designer is working on an API, but at the end of the day, it's an experience and there's uh, an interface into it, so. Yeah, I know that um, a year or more ago, um, there were some 
work done on a, a CLI help for PCF that, that Monty, the designer, led. Um, and right, the, the, the work that I'm talking about with Madlib is something that isn't underway yet. We've just started talking about how we want to do something along those lines. Um, and I think the challenge there is that for those highly technical interfaces, right, like a query language, a set of command line controls, um, the people who, the, the, the genesis of the, des, like the, the subject matter expertise for designing that is technical, right? Like I'm not gonna be able to walk in with my user-centered design expertise and experience and say, okay, here's how this query language should be laid out, right? But what I can do is pair with someone who has that deep technical knowledge of what is possible and what they need to express. And then, I'm, and then my plan is to work along with them to kind of um, <clears throat> do a little more of the, like, the, the navigator version of pairing where like you're going to drive and I'm going to I'm going to look at the big picture I'm going to keep you on the rails I'm going to say looks like we use this style of noun here like let's make that you know those types of things right um, that's a really challenging one I, I don't have a ton of experience with that yet but I'm really that's one of the things that excites me most about being with the data group is doing that Other questions um do you have any suggestions for what I can do as an engineer when I feel like my team is feeling pain because we don't have user experience or we haven't had enough user experience research? Um, so I've been in the situation before of being on a very technical project and of experiencing confusion over who are we building this for and kind of a sense of like, oh, we have a couple of different people that maybe are using this and we don't really understand any of them very well. We're just kind of guessing and arguing about which one is more important. And I was not sure in that situation of how to, you know, I tried to be like, well, we have a tool for solving this. It's called like user experience and having a designer. And they were like, oh no, it's, that's too formal. We don't want to, and anyway, we don't have anything visual. So why could, why uh -huh. would we use a designer? Do you have any suggestions on how to have that conversation if there's anything that I can do in that situation. Yeah, I, I, you smiling too, you have some <laughs> advice. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, yeah, the advice that I'll give is actually I've, I gave this advice recently to a, to a team in another city, um, is just keep just every retro, right? Like that's, that's one of the great things about working here is if you have an issue, voice it. And if it doesn't get resolved, continue to voice it, right? Um, and just make it, make your pain felt. That's, that's step one, I think. I'll pile onto that. It's gonna be kind of meta, but I think a lot about this. Um, the, the means of production are highly available to anyone. Anyone with a laptop can build an experience and, um, and now thanks to Pivotal Cloud Foundry, they can deploy it to the world with one command. And um, that comes with a lot of responsibility and it does come with a responsibility to have rigor around now that I put something in this world, like I need to figure out if it's the right thing. Um, user experience design and all, all the keywords and stuff around that, it's just a different way of solving problems. It's still a problem solving activity and so I think um, people who are open to that perspective um, and understand that it's a learning journey and it's gonna be trial and error um, are gonna enjoy their work a lot more because they're gonna, gonna get feedback about whether what they're doing has value. The rigor around um, who is our user, who is our customer here, and um, I think somebody on your team just has to put their foot down and be like, no, like we're gonna focus on one user, one use case, and go from there. And otherwise, there's just too many things to be distracted by to get a good result. It's kind of like the scientific method, if I can also put that out there. Other questions? Oh, Jessica in the front. 
I missed a few questions, so I don't know if it's already been asked, but um, I'm guessing you guys have some experience working with data, making that data more useful, more uh, tell a real story for the users that are consuming large amount of, amounts of data. Have you run into the problem that you're not able to get access to real live data, but still need to be able to, to test that with users and make sure that it's valuable, and how have you dealt with that? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, God. Okay, so Greenplum Database, for example, runs on, like I said, like hundreds of servers at a time, right? And the scale and scope of the data set which we would need to have available to, in order to present and work with a, a representative sample um, is, is pr like, we've been working on it for three months and haven't really figured out exactly how to do it, right? Um, the tactic that I'm planning to try next is um, we're going to be releasing uh, some of this GPCC interface, the command center interface, um, alongside the existing legacy release and going in, like actually going to clients and saying, hey, um, if you go to slash new slash whatever, you're going to see this, this new interface with your data running through it. Like, can we check that out? <laughs> they literally using, like having to wait until you get into the client environment to really see it. Um, otherwise, you know, the other uh, things we've done is being able to find a couple of um, fairly open clients who've been able to give us some snapshots. And um, do they do they like sanitize the data before they give it to you? Like take out yeah, right. personally the, identifiable information and stuff like that? The, that's part of the problem. It was like the, like the queries are, are often like their secret sauce. Um, and so these are clients where they've got some less sensitive stuff they can share. But I wish I had a good answer for you. But um, I will say that designing without representative data is like shooting in the dark. And sometimes you just got to acknowledge that and then work with it. Right? The, um, the problem I run into is having um, realistic content. If you notice, I put up a screenshot that had like Dropbox for toddlers and you know, like all these fake app names, um, which is actually that's a really good idea though. But um, so I, I run into a problem where I don't have good content, like real content. And, and, and I'm coming to the realization that just means I don't understand the space well enough yet and that maybe it's not the time to like start building a UI. Maybe it's time to like keep learning, right? And part of that learning process is right. gathering as much stuff as you can. You know, I think in, in legal terms they call it discovery, right? Like discovering all the relevant matter um, and then just going from there. And um, on the metrics project where metrics is about getting, um, you know, trying to replicate or visualize thousands of requests per second to an app, um, I know uh, Kevin Gates, who's not here, he, um, he's working with snapshots. And then he's actually writing Python code to manipulate that data and visualize it in ways that are not like dependent on a JavaScript framework, but using like off-the-shelf Python libraries for data viz, just to experiment. And, and then it eventually leads to like a high fidelity prototype that looks like closer to the end product. So, that's a good question. Anything else? Oh, I see you on there. What makes working on a technical product exciting as opposed to, did you say Foursquare? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like consumer facing, yeah. Uh, I like making tools for the creators. Um, when I worked at ThoughtWorks, I was kind of in this similar space. I worked on project management tools and CI tools. And it's really cool to make things for makers. Um, they're very picky about what they want to. And they're just as bad at articulating what they want consumers are. So it's still very challenging and interesting. Uh, you know, for me, one of the things is that I'm, I'm actually really, really enamored with technology with like the the magic of programming 
right? And like, I, you know, I get, I get a, um, you know, Postgres installed on my laptop, and I run like, I put like two tables of data in it, and I do some query, and I'm like, oh my god, that's so cool! Like, this thing came back, right? Like, and just being in, immersed in that highly technical environment um, is, so, is kind of pushes my boundaries to understand and appreciate the deep technology more. Have you found that the design engagement on a product is not as long as the PM or the engineering engagement on a product in your experience? Like, do I, coming from a Cloud Foundry context, we've had a resource scarcity on designers, and we've also had a lot of times where we say, oh, well, we don't need a designer for this part. We're, you know, we have the design, which to me feels like we end up missing out on a lot of the opportunity for designers to do not the obvious blocking work, but the like surrounding more deep learning work that can go on in parallel to implementation. So I'm just wondering, has your experience been that designers roll off before they have a chance to like settle in? <laughs> and do you have anything to do about that? I'll say for me, in an in ideal world, um, if there's a product manager on a team, there's a designer on a team, right? Like, there, it's not a role that is that is a part-time or a plug-in. It's also part of it, I mean, there is a scarcity issue, right? Um, part of it is also expanding the purview of design thinking and user-centeredness to be greater than just the designers in the in the room, you know? Um, it's It's hard for us, I mean, you can probably talk more about the ways that you've had to triangulate your own time to manage that. But. Yeah, it feels like a triangle. Sometimes I'm working on three things. Um, so I, I think it, um, because we don't have a, you know, we don't have 45 designers, um, we, we just choose wisely which initiatives they work on. Um, yeah. I don't, I mean, it's, we have the same problem with engineers too, right? Like engineers rotate and some teams need more and others don't. And did they, did they get all the engineers they needed for as long as they needed? Who knows? Um, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Uh-huh. So if we did have 45 designers, do you think that the presence of a designer on every team all the time would pay off for that? Like if we could get 45 more people and we get designers instead of engineers, do you think that easing that constraint instead of the engineering constraint would be worth it? We can try it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We, just, we work on what we believe is the most uh, important thing at the time and maybe has a higher degree of uncertainty about what the solution is. Because part of, part of design is exploring potential solutions and validating them, rather than going with the first one we think of. So, so I think I could probably call time on questions. Is there anyone else who had a burning thing? We're available all the time. Uh, T. McCoy, M. Long, hit us up. All right, thanks.